Then uh, hello again from me. My name is Timo Heuer. I'm a software developer from Northeast Germany. Um, I'm streaming from a little village near Rostock. And I'm working for a company doing some yeah, software development stuff, consulting stuff. And they are called Alto Digital Innovation. And we do also some kind of community work like uh, Stefan already uh, introduced me a little bit. So uh, thanks there for the nice words and the possibility to be here and talk a little bit about one topic I really like to talk about. And these are, oh, let's move this away. Okay. And um, about cellular automata and why I think it's interesting and so on. I will tell you in this talk. At the beginning, probably in the first half, I will speak about the theory background. We are speaking a little bit about simulation. What is a cellular automata? And uh, later, we will talk a little bit about the BV game engine. How did I find it? How did I choose it? And later, a little bit into software architecture. And in the second half, we will have a look at some uh, code I wrote for one cellular automaton. And probably if we have time left at the end, I prepared some project I did during my apprenticeship, uh, also related to cellular automatas. So let's, let's start. Why, um, why cellular automatas? Or what, what is a cellular automaton? So um, it has a very simple definition. And it goes something like this, that you have a discrete space, which is defined. Let's think of a 2D matrix with, with uh, cells or with fields. And um, I already mentioned it, you have cells. And this discrete space is divided into cells. And these cells have a state. And uh, they probably know or in relation to the environment, to the neighbor cells, which also provides a state. And now when uh, the whole world, the whole cellular automaton will develop into the next, into the next stage of uh, its timeline, um, the state of the cells will develop depending on the states of the neighboring cells. And yes, that's it. So um, why is it interesting? You see it a little bit here because we have a grid there is something moving. I will tell you a little bit about it just in the next slide. But what I really like about it, it was one of my first programming projects during my apprenticeship. And uh, you have a lot of stuff to, to think about. You have to think a little about, uh, think a little bit about a software architecture, how to structure your code. You will probably do a lot of performance optimizations so that it runs smoothly because um, now we got to the next point for the visualization. And it's always motivating if you uh, see something uh, related to the code you are writing. And even if it's almost feels like it's uh, it's some, some kind of alive and it's only a very simple rule set behind it or um, a very simple model for the, for the um, visualization like a cellular automata where you have the cells with the states. And so you are in a good loop to yes to to have um, to have good requirements for what you are doing. What is not always the case in the uh, free world when you are working on uh, working on on your um, yeah work projects, for example. Well, it's a little bit chaotic. So yes, you have some simple rules, and you can just program it, and you can extend it, and you see that something is moving, and probably not in that way you want, but you learn a lot about programming. So I think it's a good exercise, even if you are good at programming to make something like that, or if you start with programming and do something in that kind of a simple simulation. And so let's have a look at different automatas. Uh, the most iconic one is probably the Conway's Game of Life. And uh, an automaton doesn't only send for itself to just, oh, you have a little, little rule set and then something is happening and blinking in a, um, in a way of art. It should sometimes simulate a complex, a complex aspect in a more simple way. 
And what Conway's game of life wanted to uh, achieve is that we have um, simulation about biology. So we have the cells in a world. And the cells can have two states. One is it's alive, one it's dead. So cells can be born if there are enough living cells surrounding it, but not too much. Uh, living cells uh, will survive at a sweet spot if there are not too much neighbors, so there's probably a food problem, or there aren't too less neighbors, so there's a problem for the social environment. So the cell will wither away because of loneliness. And that's, that's a very interesting approach of making a very complex topic very simple. And I've done this simulation at my homework back in the days. And uh, I, I did a lot of extra features. And I have written it in Delphi. I can show it at the end if you want to have a look at it. Then there are some other uh, simulations like Wireworld, which simulate the flow of uh, currency, of, of power. The Wartor simulation, oh, it's a little bit out of uh, layout. Um, is again a biology simulation where we have the green cells, which are fish, with the blue cells, which are sharks, or, and the sharks are the predators, the green fish, fishes are the prey, the black is just empty space in a, in a, in a uh, vast uh, water planet, for example. And uh, what the purpose of the simulation of the cellular automaton is to provide a simplification of the relation of predator and prey. And um, just a word of advice, it's a little bit flashy when I click here. And we see, uh, if you look closely, we see that the blue dots are hunting the green areas. So the sharks will try to eat the fish. So they are, will stay alive because they have to eat. And um, yes. Probably it's a little bit uh, difficult to see, but here at the uh, at the bottom of that little video, you have some kind of graph which is moving like a wave, and uh, it shows if there are a lot of prey and less predators. So there will be more predators because there's a lot of prey to hunt, and they the population will grow, and this will decrease the population of the prey and um, so there's not enough prey so the sharks will die from hunger and so it's uh, again a really complex aspect of of the nature a very simple fight with some simple rules and an automaton and it just makes fun to uh, look at something like this I just put it on again so we can have a look at it again so sometimes you really can get lost in that kind of simulations okay and uh, what I want to talk about is uh, Wolfram's one-dimensional universe. I will introduce that cellular automaton when we come to the demonstration. So, uh, yes, I stay excited. Okay, and then I got a plan. I did some lazy Googling what to do for my homework for simulation and simulation programming, you will find Conway's Game of Life. And uh, I did it back in the days with some dirty uh, spaghetti Delphi front end programming. And I did it again for the was Meetup Rostock with the BV game engine because I always wanted to do something with an with a game engine. And um, now we will go out of the slides. And I just wanted to have a look. Uh, I just wanted to find something I could use for that. Um, for that uh, simulation. And uh, probably you know that uh, there are a lot of ARWI mm -hmm, placeholder yet in the Rust ecosystem. And these are pretty, uh, pretty amazing sites, websites where you can have curated lists of different crates, especially uh, especially for this ARWI game yet. There's other stuff like ARWI async yet. Yeah, yes, now we are async. And uh, are we network yet? Are we web yet? And so on. And these are amazing sites if you want to uh, um, probably look for a crate for a special purpose. And it's much more convenient, the sites like uh, using crates.io. So, and some uh, flavor text getting started. And here is some kind of um, some sorting happening. And if you are looking for something in the field of audio and game stuff, 
you will probably browse here. If you look for something in, uh, for virtual reality, you will look here. And uh, game engines, 2D, 3D, sounds fine for me. So I had a look at it. I tried different game engines out. I um, tried to go with M Assist, but I didn't like the flow of programming. It felt like I had to do too much. I uh, went for Piston. Is it Piston? It's a little bit down here somewhere. Piston here, yes. And uh, another statistic I check if there are a lot of downloads and um, this is some kind of nice versioning. And so I tried different stuff out and I checked the Crates IO page for where is BV? Here's BV. And just check, okay, does it have a nice landing page? Uh, is here's, because it, it has, it is, has, it, it, ah, again, it, it's having a nice landing page and a good documentation. So these are good signs that it's beginner friendly. And uh, I like to use crates with uh, a good tutorial or with good docs. And I really enjoy it. And so I looked, okay, here's, it's still living, it's providing new versions. And the next stuff I check is um, the GitHub repository. Uh, we don't look into the docs. The docs are also fantastic for BV. And I will check the examples ordner for the guys and girls of you who uh, didn't know uh, this, uh, this directory in the Rust project file structure. It's a folder which holds uh, example code for different aspects. And this is really, really helpful if you want to delve into different crates. And uh, for me, which learns more in a practical way, it's much more helpful than uh, reading documentation, documentation, documentation. So I have some examples here I can have a look at, for example, for Android, because BV is cross-platform, or for iOS, or for scene handling, web assembly stuff, and so on even how games will work at all. So we get a impression from breakout example, for example. Okay, that's just this little excourse to how I uh, deal with finding new crates, which probably provide my purpose of what I want to do. And yeah, some, some hot facts about the BV game engine. The website also looks very nice, had a really good getting started stuff. So, that's the upside of that old stuff, that stuff. So I've sh chosen my simulation. I have chosen my model. I even have a game engine and I have the language Rust where I want to do it. And so let's talk a little about software architecture. So a lot of game engines are using a specific software pattern, pattern called the entity component system or are entity component systems. And it's, quite simple because it only consists of a few main components. We have the entity, which only has a unique ID. So no features for progressing some um, transition or something like that. Only one ID. Then to give this identity more, uh, this entity more identity and more information it's related to, it uh, will be extended with components, which holds data from one aspect. One aspect could be for translation. For example, if I'm moving, for example, this pen, um, we probably see there will be a component holding the information about the position. If it's moving, it will hold the information about velocity. And it probably another component will hold the information, the data about the shape, and so on. And OK, great. Now we have an entity with an identity which is unique for the whole game environment where I'm at. But now there's something to happen with it. And these four are the systems. Uh, the systems run on uh, components. So there's a system running uh, only for the translation, there's a system only running for probably for if the shape or the color is 
progressing. Or if you think of uh, more complex games, there will be systems uh, for for health, for mana, for uh, the daytime, for if you play survival games, for the handling of thirst and hunger and so on. And it always runs and it's the game loop. And to get a little bit more um, special in that way, we have a look at a little example. We have here the entity with different components docked to that entity. And like in my little example, we have some data on that components, like X coordinates, um, the acceleration, and then, so that's my, my main object I'm looking at the moment. And we have the game loop, and there are a lot of systems. Think of systems in some kind of, of functions, of methods. We have, will have a look at it at the demonstration. And um, there's a system for handling the gravity. And the gravity will have a look at all the entities and will check it, hey, are you having uh, the gravity component? Okay, great, I will do something with it. And so it gets the gravity, the entity, and does something with the gravity to calculate the new position. And then the next system will do something and so on. We have an infinite game loop. Good, and now we are at this point where we are almost at the demonstration. Uh, before I forget it, I want uh, just to mention uh, some some sources. Like um, I will provide a repository with the code. I will just post it at the um, uh, YouTube stream in the chat if you want to follow during my talk further into the code. And um, I just, uh, linked some, I think, pretty good sites to get into component entity component systems or into the BV, BV game engine or into um, cellular automaton, automata as well, or what, which is a really great source of inspiration and a knowledge transmission is a subreddit for cellular automata on Reddit. Okay, then give me some seconds and I will post this into the chat. Okay. I hope I made it public, so otherwise I will just make it shortly after this talk. And now we'll have again a little theory about probably most of the uh, most simplest uh, cellular automatons, the Wolfram's one-dimensional universe. And if you think of the natural world we are living in, it's uh, it's 3D and probably much more complex with time and stuff like this. So we are not thinking in a 3D room. Of course, a cellular automaton could be 3D, but not this one. So we don't have volume. It's not in the 2D room, so we don't have an area. We have the 1D room and it's, uh, think of a line, just for a little uh, presentation. Let's imagine this is a line and we have cells and the cells don't really have space or area. They are just uh, knowing which its, its neighbor are on this, neighbors are on this line. And uh, it's not only a line with uh, defined end and beginning, it's some kind of ring. So it's infinite and closed in itself. And every cell inside this, this universe has a state. And if you have a look at something like this, you probably see, okay, I now see here something 2D. But in reality, it's um, the universe is only one line. And what we see here is the progression of the universe through time. So every new line is the next step in the, in the timeline of that universe. And we see here probably the Big Bang started small. There's a special rule set for that universe and the universe will expand and will, we see a structure. We see, we will see the textures and we will see, uh, that, our, that it will uh, develop or evolve in a, in a special way. And so the rule set is that we have, if we have a look at here, I will explain what the bit pattern means shortly in, in some seconds. We have our cell here and the next state of the cell provided in the timeline um, depends on the state from the cell itself 
from the neighboring states, from the left and from the right cell. And what we see here is, okay, if the uh, three cells are full, the next, uh, or the main cell and the left and right neighbor, the next cell will be empty. And it's, um, it's, in code, it's, it's recognized with a zero at this point. For this stuff, every cell is empty and the next in the timeline will be zero as well. For this case, the left neighbor is empty, the cell itself and its right neighbor uh, is, is filled. So the next state will be filled and it's um, related to a one. And probably you, will, uh, you already counted the digits and it's eight. So we have one byte, eight bits. And in uh, Wolfram's, if you talk about Wolfram's uh, universe and talk about different rule sets for this, because we have four cells, there are, um, we, have, we have this kind of combinations for, for the next state. And so if we want to apply a simple rule, we, we, uh, we will speak about, we, will, we apply rule one, we will apply rule 42, we will apply rule uh, 182 and so on. And there are in these 256 uh, possible combinations, there are a handful of interesting developments. Here we see the different bit combinations and this will make different structures of the universe, how it will evolve from a, uh, from a filled from a single filled cell at the beginning. So that's the theory. And now we will have a look just what is uh, happening in my little application. And we see, okay, here's something going on. We are going through the timeline and we see different uh, structures. We see that uh, some triangles will evolve through the universe. So, but it's not uh, something we saw before. But I programmed something. If I start with a single cell, we see uh, a pattern which will match to. Uh, let's let me have a, a look, and it's 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 that pattern rule one hundred eighty two. And it's, it's quite amazing to make just that kind of structures in a procedural way. Okay, and now to the code. So now you should see my Visual Studio code and everything starts with the main function. Um, because of things I've learned during my other projects, I wanted to make it a little bit more structured. And so I begin everything with some kind of configuration. And from this basic configuration, uh, other con um, um, the, the first universe state will be developed. Uh, the con I will initialize the control state. I will initialize the state of the UI to, to have um, the stuff to begin with for a default configuration. Then we have some uh, BV related stuff. We see here, um, probably you know this kind of message chaining. It's some kind of builder pattern where you prepare your application with stuff you want to have inside with different functions. And at the end, there will be a run and everything will start. Now at the beginning, I'm going to add some default plugins because BV has a plugin system inside of it. So we see here there's some uh, plugins for logging, for time management, for input management, for uh, window management, and so on. So it's a good foundation to start the program. Then I want to um, want to provide some resources. Think of resources in this, uh, in this um, gaming environment as some kind of singletons. There's only one, there can only be one instance or there is only one instance I can easily access. I only need one configuration. I only need one state of UI and uh, one state of the universe because there is only one universe in my simulation. 
Then after I prepared all the resources I have, then the systems will kick in. For at the beginning, I will define a special system, a startup system to make some basic setup. And after everything is set up, I add other systems, which now are in the game loop and will just uh, be executed whenever as, as fast as, of, uh, as often as possible and uh, not in, a, in, a, in an organized order. I can achieve it if I link the different systems to each other, but I just let a, left it free at this point. So I have one system handling the resizing of the UI. So if this stuff is, um, is, is changing, so the size of the cells, cells will change. Uh, then I have some systems for, um, for keyboard input. I have one system for iterating the universe. So here's some iteration happening. Then I have a system for visualization because when the universe is, um, is iterating, then uh, it needs to be visualized. And at the end, there's just some convenience system where I uh, it's made for examples and prototyping. If I press escape, the application will close. Now ha let's have a look at the different systems. A uh, word of warning, you will see, um, I'm just got a little, little uh, settled because I had some, some stuff. I hope uh, the, um, the hardware is still working. Okay, so um, we begin with the setup system. And yes, a word of warnings, macros. BV is using a lot of macros. And with that macros, this heavy use of macros, it's uh, providing a very, in my opinion, lean developer experience. And um, so if you're asking where I'm calling the setup and putting the commands inside, I'm not doing it. It's some kind of the macro magic in the BV background. And so I can just name or classify a function as a system. And because BV knows it's a system, because it's named here, I can provide different arguments. For the setup is simple. The commands are something where, can in, where I can interact with the game engine. I want to start uh, to spawn um, or to prepare everything for uh, a 2D camera. So for the keyboard in, uh, input system, it's more, more complex. I have the commands because I want to react to the keyboard inputs. I access my resources, which are fixed, like uh, the configuration or from the default BV plugins, uh, um, the input system provides me here the key pressed in that manner. Then I have the control state, the UI state, and because probably something will happen uh, for the uh, control state and UI state. And uh, so um, it's mutable in that. And now here we have something related to the software architecture of entity component systems. I have a query where I can uh, demand all entities which have the component cell, and then I can work with them. And then, yeah, some stuff is happening for the keys. Here I have some uh, for my resize notification notification for resizing resizing the window, and I'm doing it in a very not perfor performant way because I'm just despawning everything. There are better uh, options. I'm from time to time I'm optimizing this this little example, so it's getting better. Then I have my iterate universe, which just which is just calling on that universe state, which is an automaton. So iterate and it will work on itself. And then probably for the last stuff we have the, um, that I want to update the visualization. And I did some optimization. In my opinion, I'm only scratching all at the surface of the BV game engine. So I only visualize or draw new cells if it is necessary. And I only draw the timelines which are necessary. And then it gets through everything, gets the positions and yeah, 
the most uh, the, the the more interesting part is now here when we go um, to the sprite bundle, and the sprite bundle uh, spawns a basic entity with the components for the visualization where we have uh, where where is it on my screen uh, which color does it have and so on and with the commands i will um, not only spawn the bundle for the representation i want also to add the component for the cell so that my game object object my entity has these informations and so I'm spawning the bundle, and now here I can do again with method chaining, uh, build more and more components to uh, bind more and more components to my uh, to my entity. It's not really necessary for my processing at the moment, but it helped me uh, to uh, for some debugging reasons at this moment. Okay, and then we have. Just a last helper function where I can um, get my my stuff. And generally, I uh, separated my code mainly in two parts. So the automata is completely independent from the UI. So if I want later to make another presentation, because to be honest, it's fun to play around with with BV and a gaming engine for this kind of stuff. But if you want a really efficient way, you probably would go for some OpenGL stuff or for drawing directly. And so you have uh, an entity system, a component system has very less overhead, but with that kind of presentation, you have even less overhead. So, and because we have some minutes, I just want to show you some of my stuff I did during my apprenticeship. And uh, yes, this is some application written in Delphi for Conway's Game of Life. And this is just some prepared stuff. I can draw here if I want, but I don't want it at the moment. And just set hi. And if I press start, the system will start to develop. And I made some check that uh, it recognized, OK, the world stagnated. It's not moving anymore because these are stable figures in Conway's universe. I prepared some stuff uh, like like this. Okay. So I will generate. This is now uh, random. Green is alive, black is, is dead. And now I will just press start. And you will see there's some movement. Some, say, uh, some kind of stuff is evolving. Some, uh, some figures will be there. There will be some uh, flickering figures like this. And uh, one thing you saw at the beginning of my slides was a glider, just an, an object which moves um, infinite. And I provided some uh, some nice stuff like, or some, some extra stuff like, what is if uh, the borders are con considered as being alive? So we, uh, I think I have to reset and then. We have something like this because we have an endless source of uh, living borders providing some stuff. And uh, you can have a very complex, not very complex, you can have a very simple rule set for that kind of stuff and you can achieve amazing, amazing, uh, amazing uh, outcomes. So for example, you can use it for generating some kind of mazes. So if I start here, you will say you don't doesn't have don't have the flickering anymore. We have something growing like a sponge shroom or I don't know, something like that. So it's not really a maze, but uh, it probably look almost looks like it and it grows. And one of my favorite worlds is the copy world. Where we have we start with something, I've um printed it in preparation. And then it looks chaotic. It gets into new forms, new forms. And at some point, we see uh, it copies from the, from the center. And if we go further and further, and it's more chaotic, again, we have the faces, which were one step before some chaos like this. And with the rule set, bam, a lot of happy elves. 
Okay, and there's uh, a lot of stuff going on just as the last stuff. Here's a blinking world, which you can use probably for terrain generation or something like this. There's uh, with rule set, it will stabilize in some um, some some areas it's called it this and if you then uh, keep uh, running or developing it just start blinking okay and with the last slide from my uh, presentation it is it's here here and here just one stuff from the um, subreddit of cellular automaton from Reddit. Here's some piece of cellular automaton art <laughs> called the mountain. Yes, and then I'm finished.